Good morning, everyone, dear colleagues. It's a pleasure to welcome you again to, for this second sitting of our Standing Committee on Peace and International Security. Today, we will address a particularly interesting topic, namely sustaining peace as a vehicle for achieving sustainable development. I invite participants who do not already have the concept note for this hearing to pick up copies. As stated before, these documents and much more are available on the IPU Assembly app that I hope you have all downloaded. Dear colleagues, may I now call to order this meeting? I'm sure that our deliberations will be constructive and fruitful as usual. Before we really begin this session, I would like to recall briefly the objectives of such an expert's hearing in our committee work. The purpose is, on the one hand, for IPU members to be better aware of this very interesting topic on which the first committee on peace and international security will be formally debating during the 138th IPU assembly in Geneva. On the other hand, this expert hearing is also an intermediary checkpoint halfway through the resolutions drafting process. You will remember that following the decision of the 136th assembly in DACA, two co-reporters were appointed for this item, Mr. Marisol Vargas Barcena from Mexico and Mr. Andrea Caroni from Switzerland. Who, uh, Mr. Caroni is here now today to hear your views on this topic. As you know, the IPU resolution making process foresees that co-reporters begin preparing the draft resolution after the full assembly to be able to take into account the various views of the IPU members on a specific topic. Hence, today we will not discuss the resolution substance, stances and drafting, but rather the concepts that will be addressed in the resolution. Indeed, the hearing aims to assisting our two co-reporters by providing them guidance in their work on the draft resolution to be prepared by mid-December. Let me remind you that there that member parliaments had until 29 September 2017 to submit to the Secretariat written contributions to the resolution. Unfortunately, not a single input was received. Should you wish to still make one, please contact urgently the Secretariat of the Committee. With regard to the logistics, let me explain in how we shall organize our work. As you know, today we have until 2 uh, 12.30 for the hearing, both for the keynote speeches and for the questions and answers exercise. The key experts will provide their contributions to the issue at hand. Thereafter, the floor will be given given to you for question and other contributions. All of you who wish to take the floor to contribute will have up to three minutes to do so. Um, as usual, we do not have a pre-established list of speakers. Should you wish to take the floor for a brief question or a comment, please use one of the forms that are available for you on the tables. Simply fill in the form and pass it to the committee secretary over here. Given the short time available, as usual, I urge the delegates to be really brief and to speak from their seats. Let me remind you that the focus of the panel is sustaining peace as a vehicle for achieving sustainable development. Dear colleagues, I look forward to hearing your views, good practices, and thoughts on this subject, and since it is an extremely wide topic, how, would, how you could narrow it for the resolution to be a short and operational one. Before, let me introduce our experts. Mr. Henk Jam Brickman, Chief Policy Planning and Application Branch of the UN Peace Building Support Office. Ambassador Gunther Backler, OSCE Special Representative for South Caucasus. Hans Born, Assistant Director and Head of the Policy and Research Division of ICAF. Thank you all of you for uh, joining us in this important meeting of this committee. Well, now let me now give the floor to our guest. Um, firstly, Mr. Jeng Hank Brinkman, you have the floor. 
Um, thank you so much, uh, Senator uh, Rojas, and, and thank you for inviting me uh, to be here. It's uh, really a pleasure um, to, um, to interact with the parliamentarians, um, um, I think, are, uh, as a real important constituency of the, the kind of work that we do. Um, over the last uh, two years, um, the world spent uh, $71 billion um, on crisis response, and that only includes um, UN peacekeeping operations and official development um, humanitarian assistance and official development assistance actually spent on in donor countries um, to, uh, on, on refugees. Um, on top of that, um, we have had um, some really important uh, uh, outbreaks of, of violence in the world and, and, and particular relapses of violence um, in Central African Republic and South Sudan, for example, in Yemen. Um, and um, this really uh, instigated an, um, the, a review in 2015 of what the UN is doing uh, in terms of, of peace building. And it went way, way beyond um, just our uh, little office. Um, uh, and, the, and the result of that, we, uh, we got the resolutions that were adopted uh, uh, simultaneously by the General Assembly and the Security Council on, on sustaining peace. And I want to mention four particular elements um, that are really, I think, uh, go to the core of, of, um, of those uh, resolutions. Um, they relate to um, uh, the fact that you have to do this uh, throughout the conflict cycle, that you need comprehensive approaches, um, inclusive national ownership and partnerships. So let me say a little bit more about uh, each of them. Um, the, the resolutions uh, explicitly recognize that peace building and sustaining peace is something that you need to do um, before, during, and after a violent conflict. Um, and wh why is this important? Um, it's important because in the UN um, intergovernmental bodies, in particular in the Security Council, uh, peace building was viewed as something that you do um, uh, post-conflict um, and after peacekeeping. So there was both a, a linear approach um, that you do, uh, you have a conflict breakout, you mediate it, and you have peacekeeping, and then you do peace building. Um, uh, and, um, um, uh, but also uh, um, something that only happens after a conflict. And the, the post and pre-conflict period is much more difficult to determine with a, a new nature of conflict. Um, so those approaches are much less uh, valid um, than before. The second um, uh, point is about coherence uh, and, and comprehensiveness. Um, and I've, I want to say a little bit about uh, the changing nature of conflict um, uh, that, that I referred to already um, that is so important in, in, in this regard. Um, the, when the United Nations was founded, you basically had only a, a wars between countries. Um, and then you had war of independence. Um, and during the Cold War, you had uh, kind of uh, a lot of civil wars that were about uh, the structure of government or the, the nature of the economic system. Um, but then after the end of the Cold War, we saw a lot of different kinds of violence emerging um, and the different kinds of violent conflicts. Um, and, and one of the critical um, aspects of that is that you have a lot of non-state armed groups um, in the conflict. Um, in Syria alone, you have, for example, more than, uh, more than a thousand. Um, so the time when the UN could just put two parties in a room um, during the Cold War um, in Central America and countries like Angola and Mozambique, negotiate a peace agreement, put peacekeepers on the ground, uh, and implement a peace agreement is, is, is gone. Um, so the traditional instruments of the UN that we have, in particular peacekeeping operations and uh, mediation and facilitation and using the good offices of the Secretary General, are much less effective in these kind of conflicts. And that's why we argue that you need a comprehensive approach that not only involves the peace and security part of the house, but also in involves the development actors, the humanitarian actors, and the human rights um, actors. Um, the third point is about uh, ownership. There is a, a lot of em um, uh, um, emphasis on, on inclusivity. Um, so it's national ownership, but it goes beyond the government. Um, and we need other actors um, to be part of the peace building um, uh, and, uh, processes. Um, because uh, uh, partly uh, peace building is so um, uh, difficult, um, you have to often vested interests that are um, against reforms um, because um, they might lose power or in both an economic or political term. So you need to build coalitions of civil society, the private sector, um, uh, and, and, and other groups, uh, the population in general, 
to be able to, to support the peace process. And I think that parliaments are also, in that regard, incredibly important um, actors um, and, and, and stakeholders um, and agents of, uh, of change. And there is a lot of evidence that inclusivity actually makes um, peace more sustainable. Um, in particular, uh, meaningful participation by women in peace processes have shown very clearly that peace agreements last much longer and have less likely of relapse. Um, but also in general inclusivity. Um, there is a, a academic research that looked at like 57 different uh, peace agreements. Um, and the one most important single factor that uh, uh, came out as, as um, the reason for uh, uh, why peace agreements fail uh, was um, political exclusion. So if you exclude a certain group in society um, that is not part of the process, um, then the, it, it's much more likely that, that um, grievances are build up, that there is mobilization, um, political entrepreneurs take advantage of that um, and instigate um, violence. And the final aspect um, of the resolution that I would like to mention is, is partnerships. Um, and I partly uh, refer to it, but the resolution has a very strong emphasis on, on, um, on this. Um, and not only civil society in the private sector, um, but also uh, regional organizations. And they have become much more important um, in the world. And certainly for the UN, they have become much more important. Um, so the African Union in Africa, ECOWAS in West Africa, et, et, et cetera. But also, also we need to work much closer with international financial institutions. And we are working very closely with the World Bank, for example, at the moment, um, uh, in particular on a study um, on uh, prevention of, of violent conflict. Um, and I would be happy to say a little bit um, more about that. But why is this important? Because the UN um, is, is never alone um, in, in any country setting. Um, but it's really also the biggest actor. Um, although when there is a peacekeeping operation, um, it, it often is the biggest um, uh, actor. Um, so, but, but this, um, these resolutions certainly fit into the larger picture that we have been em emerging, certainly um, the, the discussions that have taken place at the United Nations um, and agreements that have been reached on, on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Sustainable Development Goals inside there, which had an explicit um, recognition that peace and justice um, is a very important development outcome. Um, I think this has been an incredible achievement. Um, I was heavily involved over the, over the years, um, and um, uh, that we have this broad approach now to development that very clearly includes peace um, outcomes and justice outcomes is, I think, an incredible achievement and opportunity uh, and entry point also for discussions at the, at the local level. Um, but we also have the, the climate change uh, agreement, and, um, um, and there is uh, quite a bit of work also about the linkages between climate change and, and violent um, conflict. <clears throat> um, so let me say a few things about the, um, uh, the links between the sustainable development goals and, and sustaining um, peace. Um, there is very clear, uh, clearly recognized um, that these two are... Uh, complementary and mutual reinforcing that you cannot have peace without development and no development without peace. Um, and that, um, but there is a very important concept in the uh, uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and that is the promise to leave no one behind. And to leave no one behind means that we really need to take um, uh, account and address uh, uh, violent conflicts. Um, because um, uh, those are left behind are very clearly in those um, countries. Um, violent conflict has really become the biggest obstacle to sustainable development um, in the world. And so we need to be much better at working in conflict settings, and, but also much better at working on conflict um, in, in conflict uh, settings. So addressing the root causes and the drivers of violent, uh, violent conflict. Um, but there are important overlaps between these resolutions within uh, the United Nations. Um, first, they very clearly recognize that um, uh, the primary responsibility is really a national responsibility. It's a governmental responsibility, um, both for sustainable development and for sustaining peace. Um, both recognize uh, and, and have a very people-centered approach. Um, it's really about um, individuals and human beings um, and how their well-being um, is being um, uh, improved um, through um, uh, uh, peace and development. 
Um, they both also very much recognize that um, the, the new nature of conflicts that we see um, is, is very complex and complicated, and that it is driven by an, a set of actors. Um, um, you know, von Clausewitz said in the 19th century that war is politics by different means. Um, and that has clearly is not the case anymore. Wars are being fought over uh, social economic inequalities, access to natural resources, um, uh, just for criminal uh, purposes. Um, it, is, it is really um, a, a much broader set of drivers that we have that need to be addressed. Um, and that's why I also think that um, the role of the development sector um, in preventing violent conflict has become so incredibly important. And there are various aspects within the sustainable development um, goals um, that clearly address um, drivers of violent conflict. Inequality is one of them. The UN World Bank study that I just mentioned on the prevention of violent conflict very clearly recognize that inequalities among groups within a society is one of the most important factors driving violent conflict and that they build up grievances over time and that they can lead to mobilization of groups and violent conflict um, and that that's why you need to address those drivers very early on before they break into violence because once you have a civil war um, 57 percent of the cases means that they will continue a civil war after one year. Um, so you need to really prevent that from happening um, because then your, your chance of success is much, um, much larger. Um, so, uh, and it's not, um, uh, so the, the drivers of violent conflict inequalities, um, but also the management of natural resources, transparency about the revenues of natural resources and how they are spent and in which communities um, jobs, um, etc. Um, but it's not only about Goal 16. Goal 16 is about our uh, peaceful and inclusive societies. Um, but peace and security are, and, and inclusivity and justice are, are woven throughout the 2030 Agenda. And in fact, 36 out of 169 targets are related to peace, justice, um, and inclusivity. Um, so maybe I, I, um, I leave it here and, and I will be happy to, to take some more questions uh, to, to go into more detail. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for the, this remarkable presentation. And now I'll give the floor to Ambassador Gunther Bagler from the OS, OSCE. 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 <laughs> Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning, and I highly welcome your interest. I think those of you who are sitting here today, they have certainly an interest in the topic. Thank you for inviting me. Um, maybe I have to mention that OEC is a, a regional agreement under Chapter 8 of the UN Charter. So. In a way, we are part of the UN family, and it's not so different. Um, first, maybe my first message today is, ladies and gentlemen, and this is maybe the bad news, um, we are very late. I mean, not today, of course, we are delayed, but in general, when it comes to peace building and conflict management. Um, let me remind you that in 92 and in 94, we had already two major charters at the, from the UN Secretary General at that time, Boutros Boutros Ghali, on uh, the agenda for peace and the agenda for development. In a way, we have been knowing since then what's, what's on the agenda and what has to be done. Of course, it was very early and in the meantime, we learned a lot of lessons. Nevertheless, academically speaking, uh, we uh, lost, in a way, 20, 25 years, you know, with really addressing all these issues that were mentioned in that uh, resolutions. In my own organization, so we see, we had a very interesting paper, 1993, after the end of the Cold War and the new conflicts in former Soviet Union. It was a paper on 
how to address localized conflicts in basically in Europe, in the OEC uh, domain. It's an extremely important paper and I can only recommend to you to read it and study it and maybe take some of uh, the ideas up for the resolution. Unfortunately, nobody knows the paper anymore, so it's not in a discussion, but recently when we had to deal with localized conflicts in the Caucasus, some colleagues found this paper of 93. So it's a very old one, nevertheless it's very timely, it's very modern. At the same time, I could refer to many documents, you know, we had um, uh, the first uh, document, <coughs> documents on peace building in 2005, you know, from the Peace Building Commission. We had a Prahimi report even earlier in 2000. Um, we had uh, reports on, on comprehensive approaches to peace building and peace uh, keeping, um, and so on and so on. So there are a lot of things we, we address quite early, and by the way, also on climate change and and conflict, uh, we did the first studies in the academic field uh, for the Rio conference, so beginning of the 90s as well, you know, on the link between resource scarcity, resource pollution, depletion, and, and conflict. And I myself was an academic uh, person at that time, and I focused a lot on resource conflict in, in, in the Sahel and in the Horn of Africa. And uh, I could tell you a lot of stories about uh, how to prevent such conflicts. My second point is, um, and this is also not very good news, but uh, nevertheless, um, we try to address it. You know, the, the number of conflicts, uh, in particular domestic conflicts, civil war, is again on increase. We had a certain period, you know, beginning uh, of 95 till 2005, 2010, when somehow UN and others were quite uh, successful in addressing uh, violent conflicts throughout the world. Also, somehow remnants of the Cold War and, and try to find a comprehensive peace accord, a solution, peacekeeping, post-conflict management. But now we are again on increase. This has to do with violence related to Islamic State uh, on the one hand, but not only, we do have more and more internal conflicts that became internationalized. So international actors are, are involved in domestic conflicts more and more. And this creates not only very complex situation, but blurs the line between domestic and international conflicts. Uh, related to that, we have to say that uh, mediation in such conflicts is partly successful. Yes, mediation matters, mediation is important to bring violence down to um, engage in conflict transformation. But here also, uh, we have a relapse in violent conflicts after five years of a mediation attempts in many conflicts, at least half of them. So this has to be avoided, you know. Mediation is successful, but five years later we don't care and then there's again violence coming up. Another issue here, we think, you know, the marketplace for mediation is overcrowded. This is by no means the case. In general terms, I can say only 40% of the conflicts we experience nowadays of more than 50 violent conflicts, there is no mediation. Um, if, if we take the duration of conflicts in so-called conflict diets and we count the years of conflict, 20, 30 years down the river, we can say in conflict diets nowadays, uh, measured by years of conflicts, only 20% of those years and conflict diets there is mediation. This is very little. And the mediation is concentrating on Europe, on conflicts in Europe. We have more mediation and more successful mediation in Europe. But when you go to Asia and also to the African continent, we see much less of uh, mediation attempts. So when you take 100% of African violent conflicts, only in 18% of the cases there's real mediation going with international uh, support, be it African Union or, or, or others. 
So against this, we have to say, you know, peace building, of course, uh, and uh, sustaining peace means first and foremost uh, to mediate, to facilitate in violent conflicts as early as possible, also as a means of prevention in order uh, to bring the number of violent conflicts down. So mediation is, of course, a crucial issue, but it's not everything. And I fully agree with my colleague from the UN, we need more comprehensive tools and approaches. Peace building is one of them. Now I think, and this is very much appreciated, you try to adopt a new uh, concept that is even uh, further uh, engaged in differentiation and long-term involvement, it's sustaining uh, peace. And here I would say, I would like to add, and this is my third message, uh, some observation. Of course, peace building, sustaining peace is extremely important. However, you have to observe a few, a few lessons learned here. First of all, um, peace building does not only start after violence had been stopped. Uh, peace building is a long-term endeavor. It starts as early as possible in terms of prevention and early warning. Here I have to say early warning systems are not, are not well developed. Uh, we, we developed one in Switzerland once for the government in 94 after the genocide in Rwanda. And we had a very sophisticated early warning uh, for prevention of genocide and internal wars. But I must say, you know, the political leaders, the ministers, the tops of governments, they do not like early warning systems and they do not know how to deal with it how to digest it, and how to act upon all these systems. So here, I think there is a responsibility of parliaments, together maybe with the academic community, to make early warning and prevention more robust and more kind of digestible also for political leaders for decision making. Otherwise, it will not, it will not really work. Um, Long-term engagement does not mean that we focus all our attention, all our financial means on a time around the peak of the conflict and maybe post-conflict for, for the first few months or one or two years. Here the marketplace is very crowded. There are many special envoys, many mediators, a lot of instruments, a lot of funds, but maybe only for two years. And this is going sometimes to spoil the context for peace building it's going to spoil the context for sound mediation. When you are an architect and you build a house, it's not good to have 10 architects to build the same house. You know? The building might be very strange. But when it comes to peace building, sometimes you have 10 special envoys and they all want to build the peace house. It's not going to function. However, five years before, in terms of prevention, or five years afterwards, the situation is a desert again. You won't find all these people anymore. You know, humanitarian aid is phasing out, peace building funds are phasing out. And we know from studies also from the World Bank, we need peace building funds five years after the end of the conflict. And prevention is basically not crisis intervention. Prevention is structural prevention to stabilize the system as early as possible. When it comes to crisis intervention and prevention, then it's too late already. So this is another lesson learned here. A further point is, you know, we need tailor-made approaches. Now we create some models of intervention. You know, and sometimes we have five models, but when you look back, Behind each model is maybe only one or two cases. So how can you statistically build models with one or two cases? There is very little experience on how to do a comprehensive and a very uh, effectful intervention. So it has to be tailor-made. And by the way, there are not too many conflicts. Out of 50 conflicts, at least 30 of them, we know. We studied them, we had conflict analysis, we had actor mappings, we had everything in place. So in fact, we know those conflicts, we know all the actors, the root causes, etc. So we have to work in a tailor-made, 
uh, manner to address all these issues is extremely important. Another lesson, we cannot come in uh, somehow from the globalized level from uh, top down. Most of peace building is being done in capitals nowadays, be it in New York, but also in national capitals from our countries. And we don't have always the understanding of what is needed on the ground. So more and more, and this is kind of new academic field, we focus on more flexible, on more hybrid, on more diverse situations on the ground with engaging local actors, be it parliaments, be it even governors, being local uh, politicians, uh, the famous civil society and other actors, we have to do peace building also from below, from the ground. Which means for mediation, I see always a triangle, you know? And I have seen this, for instance, in Darfur. I was three years in Darfur. There's a chief mediator from UN or from the African Union, yes. But that's not enough. Sometimes we need as a second angle of this triangle, a mediation support unit dealing with all these complex issues, with development on the ground, with resource issues, water, pasture, with environment, with constitution making and all this. So we need a mediation support that can help the chief mediator. But what we have seen also in Kenya, uh, when Kofi Annan was active in the post-election violence, you know, we need local mediation networks that have an understanding that can also mediate between local actors. Kofi Annan would not have been able to finalize post-election violence in Kenya without local mediation networks. They were very crucial and very helpful together with mediation support systems. So this has to be taken into account in sustaining peace and strategy for sustainable uh, peace. So what I would like to say here, um, Let's be more tailor-made. Let's focus more on relations, on personal relations among actors, less on systems. And let's focus on long-term engagement, which means at least five years after conflict and most probably five years ahead of major escalations. With this, we may come closer to some tailor-made uh, very effective uh, systems of peace building in order to sustain peace. Um, and final issue, you know, spending of money. Yes, we do have funds for post-conflict management, for peace building, uh, linked to development, to humanitarian aid, etc., etc. But sometimes we do have uh, too many financial means and too little expertise on the ground. That is long-term observing the situation. And more and more conflicts have become a political marketplace with economics exchange, with criminal group, with, with gangs, with those that have access to lootable resources. And they use also our aid, our financial means of UN and other actors for their uh, destructive behavior. So we have to be very careful and very tailor-made in order not to spend our money for criminal purposes and for corruption. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. And thank you, Ambassador. And now I will give the floor to Mr. Hans Born for his presentation. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Rojas, thank you very much for the kind invitation. I'm very pleased to be here with you to discuss this issue of uh, uh, sustaining uh, uh, peace and sustainable development and uh, what it means for uh, uh, parliaments. So I have seen some of you yesterday already when we talked about the role of parliament in UN peacekeeping operations and I think this is uh, uh, very closely related uh, to, to that topic. Uh, I must say we are very much on the same page, my story, as the two uh, previous uh, predecessors uh, but my angle will be exclusively uh, from the national level uh, and, and how you could uh, uh, contribute to that. So uh, what I will do actually in the next 10 minutes is also uh, uh, to explain to you that the IPU and DCAF have together uh, decided to join forces 
uh, and to set up a, a toolkit on how Parliament can contribute to peace and security. So uh, my aim is uh, for you to brief you on that initiative. It's not there yet, but where we are at, and uh, particularly uh, how, how you as Member of Parliament from your Council can, can, can help us with your expertise in this, in this uh, mm -hmm. uh, process. Uh, I would like to, uh, to put my presentation in five points. Uh, I would first to say something about uh, DCAF and IPU, then the two agendas, uh, then I move on to the changing security environment and the role of Parliament, uh, then from the abstract to the specific, and then I will discuss the, uh, the, the small tool. These are all very short uh, uh, things that I will uh, discuss with you. So. Uh, coming coming uh, to DCAF, DCAF is a, a, a Swiss-based, Geneva-based international foundation according to Swiss law. We have 65 uh, men, member states at the moment and it has been set up by, on, on an initiative from the Swiss uh, uh, federal government together with these uh, other member states. Our aim is to promote good governance of the security sector on request of states and to assist states to reform their security sector with the aim of making states and people more safe uh, 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 by, and at the same time with compliance of the security sector to the rule of law and respect for human rights and within the framework of democratic uh, governance. So uh, while we do this work, this important work, we are guided by the principles of impartiality, uh, local ownership, neutrality and gender equality and we are currently working in, in more than 70 states. So, it cannot be come to a surprise that IPU and DCAF have a lot of things in governments in, in, in common. Uh, uh, we, we are focusing on good governance, on democratic governance, and of course, in democratic governance, the Parliament plays an important role in, 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 any, in any state in, in the world. So we have a, a, a flagship cooperation between IPU and DCAF was this handbook what we have trans developed a few years back, which has been translated in more than 40 languages. Uh, and it has provided uh, actually Parliament with an entry point to, to start serious work on these issues, on oversight of the security sector. It has provided entry points to, uh, uh, to, to, to give a space and scope to do uh, uh, projects together, together with Parliament in many, in many, in many countries. So, but however, in the, in much of the security landscape has radically changed in the last 14 years, and that is the reason that we need to uh, adapt this. And, uh, and as, as a starting point, we use these two agendas uh, that we are today talking about. And these are the agendas of sustaining peace and sustainable uh, development. So this is my uh, 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 second point. So they were referred to as resolutions, but they, these are actually two international agendas of the United Nations, of the international community. Uh, uh, and they have been explained by my uh, previous uh, speakers. But in essence, it means that we go from the conventional approach to peace building of the 1990s to more uh, to approach that uh, uh, prevent an outbreak of, of conflict. And in particular, we're looking at, uh, uh, at the drivers of conflict and how, and from our point of view, as, as uh, uh, you as parliament and, and who is overseeing the security sector, to what extent does your security sector or your aid to security sectors abroad address those drivers of conflict? So uh, let me go to those drivers of conflict. Here they are. They, they were mentioned uh, by Henk-Jan Brinkman, uh, such as uh, exclusion, politics of exclusion, uh, illicit drugs trafficking, uh, uncontrolled migration, spillover conflicts on other conflicts, uh, mining and extractive practices, subnational conflicts which escalate on the national level. These are all identified by the UN World Bank uh, as, as main drivers of conflict. So then the task looks to me extremely simple. To what extent uh, uh, does the security sector of our country and you as the responsible authority to oversee those security sector are uh, adequately addressing those uh, drivers of conflict? But we have to make a very important footnote. Many of these conflicts are rooted in much wider consequences uh, than only security. It can be unemployment, can be political frustration, uh, but we cannot forget that security plays a very important role here. Sometimes in a very perverse way, sometimes even security sector 
uh, leads to conflict and leads to alienation of, and, and, and escalation of violence. So here, here the security sector and by extension you as the ones who oversee the security sector have to pay uh, an important uh, uh, eye on this. So this is more on conflict prevention and Henk Jan Brinkman have said that was a whole history how that we came there uh, and I cannot agree more but I have so m now more focus on what that means for you and the security sector. So then we come to the second agenda, uh, which is the, the agenda of um, uh, sustainable uh, development. Uh, my, my previous speakers have already elaborated on this, and you also know these agendas uh, of sustainable development. I only want to say here two things. The first thing is that conflict prevention and sustainable development are two sides of the same coin. There cannot be peace without development, and there cannot be de development without peace. Uh, so this is how they are very much linked. And the second thing is, if you look at this broad agenda with 16 goals and uh, uh, dozens of indicators, I think when it comes to security, there are three social development goals especially relevant, which is the SDG number five on gender equality, is the SDG number 11 on urban safety. This is about uh, threats on the uh, urban level. And we shouldn't forget, uh, at this time in po uh, of time, more than 50% of the world population lives in city. And lots of problems that we see around comes from violence and, and, and problems of, of cities. It's not only poor security, it's also very often poor governance. And then the third SDG is number 16, which, is, uh, which pleads for uh, uh, indiscriminate provision of justice, inclusive societies. This is about having accountable institutions related to security, which also s pertains to this. So this is the two broad agendas. Now I come to the changing security landscape, because things have changed recently, and we have to look at that. So. <clears throat> I think the paradigm shift within security sector governance, which actually means reframing of security issues at, as is intrinsically linked with sustainable development and, and a holistic notion of peace building. And this emanates from a continuously changing landscape of security threats and novel types of armed, armed conflicts. I think we, uh, this is, has evidence by, uh, on the UN agenda on sustaining peace, but what, what type of novel threats should we here think about? You can think about terrorism, radicalization, cyber threats, global health threats, uncontrolled migrations, and others. And as such, the responses of the states and the security sector which you oversee must be comprehensive. And we have to acknowledge, well, for example, terrorist threats require effective security sector. They need to be also accountable. And U.S. parliamentarians need also be aware that the root causes are also laid and other causes are only insecurity. So looking then now at the security providers themselves, the police, the military, the intelligence services, they are central for our lives and uh, the social uh, fabric because they are mandated to uh, uh, protect us. And we give them a lot of power to protect us uh, so that we can live free from fear and, and, and want. <clears throat> and I think it's very important for us, uh, for you as parliamentarians, that those security sectors are not only effective, that the military is effective in addressing terrorist threats, the police and the intelligence services, but that they're also accountable and that effectiveness is not disconnected from uh, uh, accountability. So, based on our work uh, in several three countries that DCAF is currently undertaking, we are very often reminded of the crucial role that you play as parliamentarians on a regular basis. And we think you're crucial in, in ensuring public security and, and make sure that the democratic standards and the rule of law are upheld throughout the effective oversight of the security apparatus. And, uh, and I think this is very important that effective parliamentary oversight has just become crucial to ensure that new security threats are met with an adequate and comprehensive and holistic response. And also that old and new security threats uh, uh, are met uh, by the security sector in full transparency uh, and uh, accountability and also adequately. So then I come to the fourth and one but last point and that is that we have to make this a little bit more uh, specific. So I'm very aware that this sounds all very general and it's now time to become more uh, uh, specific. And I think that is very important because, uh, particularly because the implementation of these important agendas such as conflict prevention 
and sustainable development is at the national level with a role for you as parliamentarian. So how can we make it more practical? Then I come to my uh, last point, which is that IPU and DCAF have agreed uh, to set up a, a toolkit for parliamentarians, as I said in the beginning. And how, how do we see this? Actually, what we see that the normal function that you have as parliamentarian should be one-to-one -one applied to the security sector. So your lawmaking powers, that is to make sure that the legal framework is complete of the security sector, that is not out of date, uh, and also that there's a right balance between human rights and, uh, and, and their powers. And then the second thing is it's not only lawmaking that you do, but also the control of the budget. Uh, are the funds uh, uh, spent properly? Uh, are they not misused? Do, do the security sector have sufficient funds? Then the third thing is, is the oversight job that you have. It's not only uh, uh, lawmaking and budget control, but also inspection visit, organizing hearing to make sure that they uh, do the job uh, properly. Then I come to the elective function. That is uh, uh, many parliaments in the world. Your role is uh, uh, to make sure that the top commanders and leading officers of the security sector uh, are those that you think are uh, uh, properly uh, uh, suitable for the job, and in many counties, parliaments uh, have hearings to make sure that that is the case. And, and the last thing is the representative function, and that is to talk about these issues with, uh, with the constituency, with, with the people, uh, and also to bring the voice of the people into uh, uh, the parliament. So these are the five generic functions, and I find it extremely important that these five functions, which are actually good governance, that they actually one-to-one -one apply to the security sector when you do your uh, 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 job. Then I come to the last slide. Uh, so as I told you, we, we are at the, at the beginning of this project, and IPU and us in, in preliminary uh, discussions, we have thought uh, we would like to develop tools for you on these thematic areas. Uh, these are still up for discussion. Uh, but actually, we want to, every time that we discuss such an uh, area, we want to apply those five uh, uh, functions of Parliament. So uh, that is your role in states of emergency, the declaration, the continuation, and uh, when the states of emergency has to end. Uh, international missions abroad, not only the military, but also the police. I don't, that is what we have discussed yesterday in, in detail. Uh, urban se security, that is the, the local lens of the security sector, not only top-down, but what do uh, uh, our security services need on, on the local level. Uh, ter terrorism and the prevention of violent extremism. Uh, human trafficking uh, and, and illegal uh, and uncontrolled uh, immigration. Organized crime. The enormous growth of private security, uh, increasingly, for example, in most countries, for each one police officer, there are two pl private, police, pl private uh, security guards. Uh, the, the control of small arms and light weapons transfer, transfer and the last one is the security threat. So, so you have to also to realize that these topics are chosen because we have to choose them in an area to what extent they relate to one way or another to uh, peace and security and particularly to the security sector. And we think that these areas are like new and re-emerging uh, 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 global security ch uh, uh, challenges uh, that, that the security sector in your country needs to uh, address. Uh, uh, and, we, and actually what I would really would appreciate now that we could have a discussion whether you think this is, list would be uh, uh, complete, would you think uh, uh, other topics should be uh, m more uh, come to the fore, so uh, that is something I would like forward to discuss with you. I thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hans uh, Brown, Assistant Director and Head of the Policy and uh, Research Division, DICA, for the interesting uh, presentation. Uh, and now I would like to open the floor for uh, your question and contribution. I invite colleagues who wish to take the floor to be, uh, to be brief and to focus on the, uh, the theme of the uh, hearing, I would like for our committee to lead the useful conclusion for the objectives and content of the final report and resolution which is to be prepared. I encourage all of us to have 
interactive discussion, please do not hesitate to make a spontaneous contribution instead of reading prepared speech, speeches. Uh, I will uh, endeavor to give every delegate who wishes to speak the, the opportunity to do so. Uh, let me remind you that each speaker will be entitled to maximum of three minutes. So please, who wants to participate, let us know. Uh, fill up the paper. I have received some of uh, the delegates' paper. Uh, still, if anybody wants to contribute, we will be welcome. So, first delegation is from Spain. No, Syrian Arab ah. Republic. Syrian Arabic uh, Republic. And then? Sweden. Sweden. And then and Jordan. So Syria is the first. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I believe that we will not have sustainable development without uh, sustainable peace. Uh, therefore, uh, sustainable peace is a prerequisite uh, to achieve uh, sustainable development. Uh, here we wish to mention four important points uh, that is necessary in uh, the preliminary drafting of a draft uh, resolution, and we hope the co-rapporteurs will take these into account. And this is a conclusion I derive from uh, the presentations I just heard. The first part, uh, sustaining peace uh, is uh, a prerequisite uh, for sustainable development. The second point, a resolution was taken in uh, the 136 session concerning intervention, outside intervention in the internal affairs of uh, sovereign states. I wish to reaffirm the practical application by parliamentarians who represent their peoples to apply this resolution to exercise pressure on their governments in this field and to halt interventions in uh, their different forms and which prevent uh, the realization of the objectives uh, of sustainable uh, development and uh, threaten international peace and uh, security. Three, the right of all countries uh, to formulate their own programs of sustainable development and to enable them to do so uh, and uh, to uh, control uh, all their resources without any uh, supervision uh, or trusteeship uh, by uh, other parties or powers, and to allow uh, countries uh, to enjoy a just uh, and fair exchange uh, with their partners. Point four is to co confront uh, terrorism, their supporters and financers, and to drain their ideological sources. Such uh, terrorism do not recognize uh, borders. They, they uh, deplete uh, the resources required for sustainable development and uh, threaten international peace and security. Five relates to my homeland, Syria. With the beginning of uh, this uh, session of IPU, the Turkish forces have penetrated uh, our territory in the Idlib area in uh, collaboration with organizations that are categorized as terrorist organizations according to Security Council resolution and in violation of uh, bilateral agreements. We condemn uh, this uh, flagrant uh, intervention and it is a threat to international peace and security. We call on IPU to condemn this as uh, a flagrant aggression on a sovereign, independent state. Thank you for your kind attention. I will give the floor now to the second country, is Sweden. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, there is no peace without development, and there is no development without peace, and none of the above without respect for human rights. The former UN Deputy Secretary General Jan Eliasson, a fellow compatriot of mine, coined this phrase. Since I stand before parliamentarians today, I think we can also all agree that a vibrant democracy is a vital tool for preventing conflicts and obtaining sustainable peace. 
However, recent developments in the post-Arabic Spring era have clearly shown that there are no shortcuts to democracy and peace. Rule of law, building effective and accountable institutions as called for an SDG 16 and on independent judici judiciary are just a vital to a vibrant and credible democracy as free and fair election. Inclusivity is also key into obtaining sustainable peace since exclusion is a driver of conflict. Exclusion will always result in equality and the risk of continued conflict. Inclusivity is also about gender equality and in that spirit nothing should be discussed about women without women. Time and time again it has been evident that women's experiences in and a civil society that includes women contribute to early warnings and alternative conflict resolutions. I think that should be considered when we're talking about this issue. Thank you very much. Uh, I will give the floor now to Jordan, please. Shukran. Thank you, Madam Chairman. There is no doubt that uh, building peace is uh, a more comprehensive uh, measure, more important measure, because we are speaking about a preventive measure that uh, can uh, succeed in uh, preventing uh, the outbreak uh, of uh, conflicts uh, and uh, prevent uh, tragedies uh, which afflict uh, people all over the world and cause uh, havoc and damage and destruction. Sustainable development is equally important. This means a partnership. It means uh, team spirit uh, and that uh, each party participates uh, in realizing development and in assuming responsibility. Here we might uh, argue about the role uh, of local government and peoples on the one hand uh, and the role of the international community on the other. We always uh, try to uphold world and global values which uh, govern the conduct of people regardless uh, of their religion, uh, their uh, geographical location, etc. Hence, uh, equality and uh, justice and uh, unifying uh, the criteria which govern uh, uh, international conduct and the means to conduct uh, extremists. All of this require international efforts and not only local efforts. Here we face a number of uh, challenges uh, confronting many of our countries. And uh, I speak about Jordan as uh, part of uh, this international community. First of all, we generally suffer from uh, the problem of realizing uh, uh, development under strict uh, control by the IMF and other financial institutions according to certain policies which leads to a certain economic uh, deterioration uh, and therefore international control of these matter is like a democles sword uh, therefore the international community uh, uh, today cannot uh, implement uh, its resolutions there are many resolutions that have been adopted resolutions uh, which uh, uh, have been adopted by members of the united nations etc well some of these countries uh, do not, uh, are not respected, and how can these remain as members of uh, such organizations? We have taken many decisions on uh, uh, nuclear arms, yet there are countries which continue to develop uh, nuclear arms, yet uh, they are still members of uh, these uh, institutions, either as well as uh, foreign intervention. There are countries which are now the scene uh, for uh, uh, struggle uh, between uh, international forces. I do not want to name uh, names, uh, but in the Middle East, uh, this is an arena for uh, conflict uh, by world powers and decision makers. Finally, Parliament uh, have a legislative role and to uphold uh, lofty principles and uh, to play uh, roles 
and uh, to enact laws uh, uh, against anyone who uh, violates uh, these standards. Yet in Jordan, we ask, shall we begin with security or begin with uh, sustainable development? Is, uh, 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 is uh, sustainable development sufficient if we are an island uh, surrounded by conflict? What happens in uh, Syria, in Iraq, and what uh, the flagrant violation uh, by the extremist Israeli government of international uh, uh, resolutions. At the same time, Jordan also uh, confronts many economic uh, uh, colleges. There is poverty, there is uh, imbalance in our uh, uh, balance of trade, uh, there's uh, terrorism, there's extremism. These are all challenges facing uh, the Jordanian economy. We try uh, to provide uh, a peaceful model and to reconcile uh, sustainable development and uh, build uh, a peace that could be a model to be followed uh, in uh, to be followed by other countries in our region. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. I now give the floor to Bahrain. Next uh, speaker is um, PNND. Thank you, Madam. There is no doubt uh, the sustainable development is an objective which could be comes before any other one. It includes human rights, um, stability, peace, uh, wealth distribution, justice, uh, trade, uh, investment, uh, which of course includes all these areas. I mean, one of the most important uh, contributors of uh, development is, is the link between the economy, environment, and society at large. What is the importance of sustainable development? Sustainable development um, is the link uh, between the present generation and the future generations, and that is a continuity for life on Earth, and people will live in harmony, and the distribution of wealth in a better way. A sustainable development is a means to reduce the gap between the developed and developing countries, and it plays an important role in reducing also in the fields of environment production and social justice and improving uh, the standards of living and increasing the educational system and reducing the other important factors. It is a link between the south and the north and that they should work in order to have their benefits and interests. Uh, the developed countries, of course, at, in times in history, of course, have looted some uh, sources of the developing countries. What are the difficulties? Uh, there are political difficulties and there are economic ones as well. And there are also technological and technical and environmental difficulties. There are challenges facing sustainable development and the face of which is how we fight uh, poverty and how to achieve uh, social peace. This is uh, what we are facing in the Near East, uh, also the environment protection through the transport policies and energy policies uh, and uh, globalization, achieving uh, security and peace uh, and the use, uh, sustainable use of biological sources, and also to provide the protection for uh, land from desertification and to put an end to the over exploitation of uh, resources. Uh, and uh, also we have uh, to refer to 2030 agenda so that you have to reduce the influence of some multinational companies um, and also we have to take into account how we can deal effectively with the pollution problem. What are the achievements that could be achieved by sustainable development? Uh, of course, it is working uh, to put the things in their right perspective and that it could help uh, development. Uh, this, of course, led uh, to some uh, impact uh, on the environment. Uh, so all countries are facing the same problems. Uh, so we have to work together in order to live in a better world. In conclusion, I will think that the sustainable development uh, is uh, 
creating some conflict between the north and the south. Each party is trying to achieve its goals without taking into account the interests of others. There are conflicts of interest, and the poor countries, of course, they are the weaker side in this formula. And as, as I said in conclusion, you, you are parliamentarians in your countries. You are, I think, the basis for uh, achieving the sustainable development and helping your countries achieve it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Varane. Now I call on PNND to take the floor. You, you want to take the floor? Sorry? Uh, OK, you have one minute, please. Sure, thank you. Uh, well, regarding sustainable development and sustainable uh, peace, uh, these, of course, uh, are mentioned in the 2030 agenda of the United Nations. You are trying to have a link between sustainable uh, peace and sustainable development. In my opinion, this is not really uh, a condition. Why? Because there are countries uh, which have achieved, of course, economic development. Uh, and. And, but they are affected by uh, outside meddling and interference. In this case, this will, of course, have a negative impact on development. I think uh, recently, in the last four years in particular, we have seen some of this uh, external meddling. Uh, we in Bahrain have faced this. Uh, we had uh, economic indicators which are very good, but because of the meddling from a neighboring country, this, of course, uh, put them down. We had a sustainable development. It was negatively affected by this uh, meddling. Libya as well had a very good indicators, but because of international intervention, interference, uh, you know what is happening in Libya now. So they should have um, a mechanism that will prevent uh, meddling in the internal affairs of some countries. The United Nations should uh, take the leading role in this respect. Uh, the UN Charter refers to this, but there is no mechanism to do that. Uh, for three days, we have been saying that we need a mechanism within the United Nations to, to help us uh, achieve what we are trying to do. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, PNND, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'd like to make a comment on the importance of disarmament to peace and sustainable development and request that the rapporteurs uh, include uh, this aspect of peace and sustainable development in the report and resolution. I'll mention five brief but important reasons. Uh, one, uh, conflicts are made much more destructive on communities, on the environment and on development uh, with the use of weapons in those conflicts, whether it's the widespread uh, use of small arms and light weapons or more devastating weapons like cluster munitions and landmines uh, which cause long-term damage to the environment uh, and prevent uh, development even after the conflicts are resolved. Uh, and there's already work on the explosive remnants of war which is very important uh, but so far has not been mentioned uh, in, in the uh, comments here. Uh, another point is that uh, arms races uh, including the current nuclear arms race, are a threat to the peace. And we see a result of these often as sanctions placed on states which are involved in these arms races. And these sanctions inhibit development of those countries. Another point is the funding uh, of weapons and the uh, use of those resources could instead be allocated towards sustainable development. Uh, in nuclear weapons, it's $100 billion per year spent on nuclear weapons. For the entire uh, d uh, weapons budget globally, $1.7 trillion. There have been proposals at the United Nations for a reallocation of a proportion of military budgets in order to support sustainable development goals, including from President Nazarbayev of Kazakhstan. But that's not the only proposal. Um, and also, lastly, there is a requirement in the UN, Article 26 of the UN Charter, specifically to work on disarmament and to make plans for disarmament in order to release resources for economic and social need for sustainable development. Uh, of course, the Security Council has not acted on this because the, the five permanent members who have veto power are the biggest beneficiaries of the arms race and selling weapons. 
But the UN General Assembly, the more democratic body of the United Nations, has been very active on this, on disarmament for development agenda, as have various Secretary Generals of the United Nations. And as a democratic organisation, I, I would think that the IPU, Interparliamentary Union, would be uh, very much looking at working in cooperation with the UN General Assembly on the Disarmament for Development programme. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Ware. Now I give the floor to Thailand, followed by Uni United Arab Emirates. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Thailand support the commitment to force stronger linkage between peace, security, and sustainable development, which we believe are interdependent and mutually reinforcing. Thailand gives importance to conflict prevention through peacekeeping operation, emphasizing the need for sustainable development in order to prevent all conflict at root causes. The concept of sustaining peace is thus supported fully. Within the scope of peacekeeping operation, Thailand peacekeeping have helped enhance capacity building of the people in the conflict area so that they become self-reliant at post-conflict, and it would also prevent recurrent of the conflict. Ever since 1958, Thailand has sent out more than 27,000 troops over 20 US UN peacekeeping operations. Among notable missions are Timor-Leste and Darfur, where Thailand has sent troops to help support local people in order for them to be able to stand at their own feet afterward. Thailand also support greater participation of women in peacekeeping, in peace building. We believe that in achieving peaceful and inclusive society, women engagement is highly crucial too. On our part, Thailand's successful national development policy and model have been guided by sufficiency economy philosophy of the His Majesty the late King. We support the realization of SDG in our country. The SEP emphasize a people center and balanced approach to achieving sustainable economic development. We have promoted exchange knowledge and best practices on SPP for other member states through scholarship, site visit, and development project, and stand ready to share experience and collaborate in this regard. In addition, the Thai Parliament National Legislative Assembly has passed two groundbreaking laws early this year, the National Strategy Act and National Reform Act which become into force this July. The two laws have highlighted interlinkage between sustainable development and national security as one aspect of the 20-year national strategic plan. The legal instrument would also task government and all public agencies with their works towards sustainable development and sustaining peace in their respective strategic plan. In this regard, Thailand stands firm to advance the agenda for the years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Thailand. Now, United Arab Emirates, you have the floor, followed by Sudan. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam. The United Arab Emirates, since it has been established, uh, is trying uh, to improve uh, peace and security. We have uh, adopted this principle and we have managed uh, to strengthen this. Uh, and uh, on international level, we are number 10, and regionally, we are the first uh, in competitivity and sustainable development. There is no doubt that there is no peace uh, without uh, development, and no development without peace, and I think we all agree on that. I see that uh, development is facing a lot of challenges in different countries. Uh, my, the previous speakers from Jordan and Syria and from Bahrain uh, referred to some matters. I would like to add uh, to what they have just said. Uh, the, uh, the challenges we are facing in building peace uh, and making it sub sub sustainable. And that is, of course, uh, this uh, violent uh, outbreaks uh, and conflicts uh, that uh, are with the cause of which uh, is the, the big number of those who have been uh, forced to migrate uh, on maybe the displaced uh, people inside their countries uh, and also uh, because of the environmental changes. These challenges, of course, uh, call on us in order to find solutions. Uh, my colleagues also refer to the fact that uh, we have to find a solution for these challenges facing us all. So I um, 
asking myself what are the reasons of these conflicts and who has the interest behind these uh, the reasons of these interests and conflicts uh, the international meddling and interference uh, and usually these come from countries which have interests and these outside the interference and meddling uh, relate to the destruction of a number of countries in the Middle East well the Security Council has no may be power to implement its resolutions uh, and this of course led to more crises uh, and uh, they have not been implemented in the first place in such in some cases uh, and this of course led to more conflicts um, we have to find solutions for these questions in the first place so that we can be able to know what are the real reasons uh, that uh, are not working in favor of sustainable development thank you madam Thank you very much. Now I give the floor to Sudan, followed by Turkey. Uh, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Thank you, madam. I would like to thank uh, the experts uh, who have uh, made these excellent presentations. Uh, in fact, uh, this meeting is how to listen to these experts uh, and what have they have arrived at recording uh, accord to sustainable development uh, and also we are here to listen to the different ideas put forward by the members of parliaments uh, which reflects of course uh, their experiences uh, with the sustainable peace and development in their own countries uh, there is no doubt that i would like to accept what has been said by the previous speakers who referred to the importance of peace and sustainable development uh, most of the international objectives uh, um, are linked to some conflicts which most of them happen in developing countries. This, of course, would reflect uh, on the instability in these countries and lack of development. I will take an example of my country, Sudan. Since our independence in Sudan in 1956, uh, Many conflicts um, erupted, well, internal conflicts, of course, erupted, uh, and this uh, stopped, of course, development uh, totally in some parts of the country. We have reached uh, a peace uh, agreement uh, in 2005, which led uh, well, to, the, to the separation of uh, a part of our country. Uh, the southern part um, has opted for independence from the north. Uh, so we have become two different countries. Few months after that, uh, internal conflicts uh, broke out uh, because of uh, resources uh, and international interference and meddling uh, led to instability in the south, uh, in southern Sudan. And of course, that led us to make sacrifices. We also paid the heavy price for the Darfur region in our country, in the West. Uh, that, of course, was used by international forces for uh, geographic and maybe uh, religious uh, reasons uh, led to that conflict. We were it started a deep consultation and dialogue with all those who took up arms, and this led to a national agreement after they have discussed these matters, and they have been participating in full, and they are now members of the parliament and the government. And these outputs, uh, of course, are having to do with international relations and identity. But in spite of that, uh, and for a long period of time, uh, we have been suffering for an embargo, uh, which uh, lasted uh, two decades. Uh, and this, of course, uh, was not helpful at all. And uh, we are members of the United Nations, uh, so we would like uh, to call that United Nations should uh, work uh, hand in hand in countries uh, that are trying uh, to overcome the problems so that we can build peace and development in our country and in our region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sudan. Now uh, I give the floor to Turkey, followed by Saudi Arabia and followed by Morocco, which is the last speaker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would very appreciate that the uh, peace and sustainable development uh, caused by women really in the area. But as Turkey, we are in Idlib because 
We have to keep the rights of innocent women, children, and keep our borders for the safeness, nothing else. And uh, it's my thought that we would be all have, giving uh, great importance to the region, and we can be all together there and see what's going on. Thank you for your cooperation. Thank you. Uh, now I give the floor to Saudi Arabia. Thank you, Madam Chairman. The previous speakers are unanimous that uh, foreign intervention is one of the most uh, important reasons uh, for the lack of security, for the lack of uh, peace, especially in the Middle East. And this is one of the main obstacles to uh, development. One of the speakers referred to a decision taken at the Dhaka Assembly concerning the role of parliaments in preventing foreign intervention. And this, uh, in relation to uh, our forthcoming uh, resolution, we should uh, reaffirm uh, the previous statement, that is, uh, the role of parliaments in preventing foreign intervention, and to have an item in that uh, resolution concerning uh, practical, applicable measures clear-cut me uh, mechanisms, such an important uh, resolution which uh, uh, took so much time and effort to arrive at a consensus, this should not just become uh, um, a uh, declaration, uh, rhetorical declaration. We should have uh, clear uh, mechanisms concerning application of such resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Saudi Arabia. Now I give the floor to Morocco. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Two basic points I wish to put forward, and then a query addressed to the panelists. One, we do not need lengthy discussion on the importance of peace and security and the relationship thereof to sustainable development. This is uh, obvious. When uh, we speak about uh, peace, we speak about stability. And here I wish to mention the Moroccan experience. We have gone through a difficult uh, uh, period uh, in 2011 uh, in the wake of the Arab Spring. But uh, thanks to the wisdom uh, of uh, His Majesty the King and the, the various uh, political uh, forces, we have arrived at an agreement concerning measures uh, which uh, consecrate uh, the democratic transformation in my country. When we have uh, stability, uh, this uh, will have uh, a benefit, uh, uh, a beneficial impact uh, on uh, uh, the different uh, activities, and this will uh, improve uh, development indicators. The point uh, which I w wish to see in the draft resolution, which will be tackled in uh, Geneva next time, this should have two main elements. One to consolidate uh, democracy as the path uh, to realizing peace and stability. The second point, uh, which was mentioned by uh, many of the previous speakers, the uh, prevention of uh, foreign intervention in the affairs of uh, states. A, a great number of speakers who spoke on this uh, come from Arab countries, from Middle East countries. As we know, this area, unfortunately, is afflicted by intervention in their internal affairs, and this has led uh, to tragic uh, consequences. The second point, does uh, peace lead uh, to uh, sustainable peace uh, or vice versa? I believe uh, that they are both uh, two faces of the same coin. So long as we realize peace, we open opportunities for sustainable development. So long as uh, we work for sustainable development, uh, this will lead to enhanced uh, stability. There is this uh, intrinsic click between the two sides. Point three, my last point, and here I wish to address a question to the panelists. Uh, 
in their opinion, what is uh, required uh, from parliamentarians and parliaments on this matter, the question of peace and its relationship to sustainable development. I believe that one of the main points which should appear in the draft resolution is to address a message to parliamentarians, to parliaments, so that may strive to consecrate the democratic uh, choice in the countries which uh, are suffering uh, conflict in order to realize peace and stability and to provide uh, the necessary conditions uh, for uh, sustainable development in these countries. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Morocco. And I thank you, all of you, once again, for, for all your valuable contributions. Well, before giving uh, the floor one last time to our uh, experts to answer questions and uh, for their final uh, remarks, and also before giving the floor to the co-reporters, I would like to, to say uh, that I think that the major, um, the major challenge regarding the uh, drafting of this resolution is precisely to make this sustain, sustaining peace concept related to the role of parliamentarians, because it is uh, very wide, I think, because it is an evolving concept so far, and we have to really um, uh, warranty that our resolution is related to the role of parliamentarians and how we as parliamentarians can uh, imp contribute to its implementation. So uh, that's something that I would like to to listen from our experts and well, and for all of you. Well, now I give the floor to um, Mr. Jeng. Mr. Jeng, please, you have the floor. Sorry. Um, thank, thank you very much, and, and thank you so much for for your comments. Um, they were very uh, uh, incisive. Um, just to make it maybe a, a few points, um, what I was um, trying to emphasize, I think, um, is uh, that we really need to look at um, early prevention. Um, and so before a conflict breaks out and before it needs to be mediated. Um, and that we really need to look at uh, what the grievances are that exist uh, among populations. And I think that parliaments play an absolutely critical role there. Um, in particular, um, inequalities uh, among groups uh, within, uh, within each country, among regions, among uh, um, uh, ethnic groups, uh, um, uh, marginalized uh, groups, uh, indigenous peoples. Um, they have to be explicitly um, addressed. Um, and I think that parliaments play an absolutely critical role in that to recognize that and allocate the necessary resources um, to that particular uh, uh, group um, or groups um, that are being uh, left behind um, as the 2030 agenda um, uh, uh, promises. Um, what is, uh, I think, uh, really critical um, in that regard is, is the delivery of social services by the government, education, health care, food assistance, etc. Um, and there is some very interesting research um, on that, that um, uh, we need to really be careful in how we think about delivering of social services to the people, um, and that we cannot assume an automatic link with um, the trust and legitimacy um, of the government in the eyes of the people. It turns out that this research shows that neither the quantity nor the quality nor who delivers it is a really have a direct relationship uh, um, with um, uh, uh, trust and legitimacy of, uh, of governments. The only thing that really matters is a dialogue mechanism, is a mechanism where um, uh, the population can express their grievances, um, can go to uh, when they know that the quality um, or the equality or the equity of the social services is not what they um, expect. Um, even if they, that ex uh, mechanism exists and they don't use it, just the fact that it exists um, increases the trust um, in government. Um, and I think there, again, this is where parliaments play an important role because, of course, parliament is a mechanism through which the population can express their views um, and let it be known to the government. 
Um, and I think um, having this, this role of channeling um, what are the concerns among the people is the primary role of, of parliaments. Um, and in that regard, perceptions play a very important role. So it's not only about um, inequalities, how it is measured, um, but also about the perceptions of those inequalities. And actually, it's the perceptions what usually um, leads to, um, to action. Um, and so we need to really have a very good idea, um, and I'm sure um, that parliaments, again, through the interaction with their constituencies, have a better idea of how um, the state or the delivery of social services or the delivery of security or justice is, is perceived by the population and how that can be um, addressed. Um, I want to say a, a, a few more points. Um, the, 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 there is um, within um, uh, 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 the world, um, in general, the international community, an enormous pressure to deliver results. Um, and that is in particular the case in donor countries where um, money is allocated to its official development assistance and the population and parliaments want to see results for that money. Um, as, as my neighbor uh, emphasized, is that peace building is a very long-term process. Um, and um, the, the results of peace building um, sometimes only accumulate over a longer period of time. But as um, um, Einstein um, at one point said, what is measurable is not um, always important. And what is important is not always measurable. So um, this is, again, where Parliament plays a role, to make sure that money is allocated to those things that, are, that is important, um, like the building of institutions that, that are accountable to Parliaments with regard to the security sector, or have a, um, access to justice and make sure that uh, justice is perceived as being impartial um, and that uh, every group in society has equal access um, to, um, to justice. Um, the other point that I want to make um, is um, that the huge difference between the Millennium Development Goals that we have had uh, between the year 2000 and the year two, uh, 2015, um, we we're very much an agenda focused on the North versus the South. But the Sustainable Development Goals are universal goals. Each goal is relevant in each country. Um, and that's, I think, uh, very important um, that, for example, the goals of uh, peaceful, inclusive, and just societies are much relevant um, in the country where I live for example, the United States um, or in Western Europe, where I'm from, than in countries where we see um, uh, uh, different forms of violence um, in the forms of, of armed conflicts, for example. Um, then I uh, uh, want to make um, uh, uh, one um, point. Uh, several of the speakers refer to um, outside interference, and I think that is really indeed a very important concern um, that we have as well. And there is a, a lot of evidence that um, when there is outside interference in an internal conflict within a country, the conflict, the armed conflict, is um, likely to last much longer. Um, so I do think that that is a very important issue that needs to be um, addressed um, uh, to, to solve conflicts and make peace sustainable um, in each of your, your countries. So thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Yes. Thank you, thank you very much. Now I give the floor to Ambassador Gunther Wagner. Yeah, I think um, it's yeah. 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 Okay. you can reach that. Um, thank you very much for all these um, valid con contributions. I think uh, what we have seen is that, of course, each region and each country has some very specific uh, challenges and I think it is extremely important uh, to know that even so we have maybe some global norms and standards on peace building that we really look into specific local situations. I think that this is one lesson and this should be part of, of any resolution. Secondly, I agree, foreign intervention and interference is now 
um, somehow back in the international agenda, also both the UN Charter and even earlier um, the League of Nations, they wanted to ban uh, this kind of um, disease of foreign interventions. It came back under an umbrella of humanitarian support and the protection of local people and even citizens. And of course, there's a big difference between, you know, protecting people in the name of geopolitics or protecting people because we have a responsibility to protect people from uh, violence and from uh, crimes and, and war crimes. So here, I think we have to be clear that uh, not any foreign intervention has to do with, uh, with protection and peace building. Um, concerning parliaments, I think it's extremely important to be coherent, to have a coherence uh, between the three pillars you all mentioned, sustainable development, sustainable peace, and human rights. So I, it could be the task of uh, lawmakers, you know, to see that there is a coherent approach of each and any country and government. Related to this, of course, um, you have to be focused. Uh, this can be a very broad agenda uh, where you lose somehow the focus and somehow the operational strength when you have legislation. That's why to focus on, on peace building and sustaining peace in the long run is extremely important in order to move towards early response and early action. Parliaments can play a role, and I give you an example from my old country, Switzerland. We did a legislation in 2000 on human uh, rights protection and peace promotion. This was a legislation done with help of the foreign ministry, but it was passed by the two chambers of, of parliament. And based on this really interesting piece of legislation that gives uh, you know, the Swiss government, the Swiss state, uh, a task in order to promote internationally peace building and human rights protection. We do have a, a so-called framework credit for the parliament, so there is a framework credit with a plan, with a concept for four years how to engage. And this gives the parliament a lot of power also to uh, somehow uh, introduct uh, and introduce strategies for the government to be implemented. At the same time, there is a monitoring function so the parliament, of course, has a, a right to monitor this four years framework credit to see what the government is doing, in which region, with which activities, with which program. And I think this can be extremely important. Um, finally, yes, I think the sustainable development goals are extremely important. It's a one world, one uh, strategy uh, component here. Secondly, on purpose, one integrated not only development goals, but also security and peace building goals. And this was a big uh, gap in the Millennium Development Goals. So again, we lost about 15 years because when we drafted the Millennium Development Goals, for some reason, nobody wanted to concentrate on long-term uh, peace building and sustainable peace. Now we are back to that, and this is good, and I think let's work on it at the global scale. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Finally, I give the floor to Mr. Hans Born. Madam Chair, Senator Rojas, thank you very much. Actually, uh, I would like to make three brief uh, points. The first one is... Uh, uh, made us more convinced than ever that parliaments are actually one of the best tools of conflict prevention as long as people speak with each other. Uh, uh, that is uh, uh, very, very important. And also, uh, parliaments make decisions whether uh, taxpayers' money is spent on bread and butter, education, or on arms. Uh, there needs to be a good balance there. That is uh, one of the first things. So, the parliament as a space as an important uh, uh, element of conflict prevention. The second one is that is our perspective of good governance of the security sector. That 
in your, each of your country, you need, you, you need to analyze with experts and you yourself within your political parties to what extent your security sector is up to speed to address drivers of conflict at home and uh, abroad. So, and these things move fastly and uh, uh, very often generals are preparing the, the previous war. Uh, so, so it is uh, you, your task to see to what extent uh, uh, the security sector in your county in accordance to the law and, and with respect for human rights is, is uh, uh, do, doing this task. And the third thing is, it was also said, uh, and this is my last point, uh, that we need to be more specific. So from the point of view uh, that, that is what my colleagues also said, early conflict prevention is the most important. How can we then break it down? What is your task uh, in supervising the security sector? What are the specific elements that you should do? Uh, so, um, Having said that, I give the floor back to the chair. Thank you very much. No. Thank you. Well, um, finally, also, we would like to give the floor to the co-reporters in order to give some views on what we have listened. So, Mr. Caroni, you have the floor for five minutes. Also. Thank you, Madam Chair, dear panelists, and the dear fellow members of Parliament, let me start with a fun fact in this very serious topic. I just realized that all the panelists' last name starts with a B, but uh, let me assure you they were allowed plan A to invite to this panel. And now with my last name, um, I can complete the ABC. I'm very grateful for the inputs that we got from the panelists, you never actually know what you get from panelists before you hear them, and now I think uh, it was re a really enriching experience having you here. Uh, starting with Mr. Uh, Brinkman, who explained the uh, concept of sustaining peace in uh, a very understandable manner by pointing out the four, four elements that we need to look at the full cycle of conflict, that we need to look at in a coherent and uh, comprehensive fashion. That and that that's something that has been emphasized by many of you is that we need national ownership in this process. And then the fourth point you mentioned is also partnerships, be it regional or international. Then I, I think that Mr. Bachler gave us very important insights from his own very practical experience out in the field. And I think that we can learn a lot from the lessons he and other people out there in the field have learned. Like for example, to start early in the process when you want to achieve uh, sustainable peace, and then that you have to be in there uh, with a long-term engagement, that you need a tailor-made approach. So this, again, a reference also to national ownership and to the inclusion of national players, uh, that you need to engage on the ground again. And then, of course, he also mentioned the point of financing. And Mr. Bourne, the third B on our panel, last but not least, gave us the very interesting example of what parliaments can actually do in the field of overseeing security forces of all kinds and in all matters that parliamentarians deal with daily. And then I had the pleasure to hearing to many of you, and uh, let me assure you that we took notes of what you have said. One point that I found in common of all your interventions was that you agree with the basic current of this draft resolution as it's being drafted, that you see the interlinkage between sustainable peace and sustainable development. I think almost all of the participants have said there's not one without the other, and of course vice versa. So that's the starting point of our draft resolution. And then, um, of course, there will be references to many documents, as always, in such a draft resolution. And I heard that you also specifically wish a reference to the last resolution we have just passed in Dhaka, and we can certainly do that. Although I have to point out that this is now is a new topic, it's a new resolution, so we're not going to just uh, redraft the old resolution again, but of course certainly we're going to mention it uh, where it is necessary. Now uh, to conclude my brief remarks, I would like to point out some elements that I think parliaments can do in this topic, and as uh, our chair, Senator Rojas, has uh, rightly pointed out, that is finally the reason for us to be here and to discuss the topic, what can parliaments do with this notion of sustain, sustaining peace that has been developed already at the UN level, Security Council, General Assembly, how can we break it down, translate it into our work? And some examples have already been given. Now let me give you some more. It's a very general point. We can just bear in mind this notion in our daily legislative work. I think it's also a, a mindset 
to see the interlinkage between the two concepts. It's by taking it into account when we, when we uh, put into practice the uh, sustainable development goals that already exist, also always thinking about the sustainable piece. And then on a more uh, concrete level, we are also involved in foreign policy and we are in exchange with our foreign ministries. So sustaining peace being also a process of reform within the UN, we can try to encourage that reform through our executive branches. We can provide the necessary funds. We have just heard of the, the Swiss example of uh, how peace building can be supported by national parliaments, by credits, also by, by oversight. We can help to strengthen uh, rule of law, good governance. We've heard uh, dialogue mechanisms are crucial. Um, also like inclusiveness in a general sense, no, one's, no one to be left behind, as we heard. And then also by playing a key role in the prevention uh, of violence before or around elections, to mention the democratic element, and also as the key role we have as parliamentarians in the reconciliation processes, because parliaments finally are get-togethers, are gatherings of people of all backgrounds, bringing together the different grievances and the priorities of the people. So thank you for this discussion so far, and we will certainly go on discussing. Let me just line out how this is going to work on the timeline. The next steps is we will now digest everything we've heard here. There will be a resolution drafted. We have until 15th December, so uh, to those of you who celebrate Christmas, this might be come as a Christmas uh, present. And then you have until uh, 9th of March of the following year then to submit your proposals, as far as we haven't already included them, so feel free to do that. And then, uh, of course, we will convene again in Geneva to discuss this, as we have done so uh, successfully in Dakar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Caroni. Now, uh, I give the floor to Deputy Marisol Vargas from Mexico in order to give her views. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Good afternoon to everyone. I also thank the experts for their significant contribution today. Above all, I do wish to apologize, and I very much am sorry that I couldn't be present from the beginning of the discussions in this committee because of the event that is taking place, in other words, the election of the future president of IPU. I had to be there for a short time, but also I did have the opportunity of hearing your comments and I took due note of them. Very rapidly, I should like to mention a few of them, a few of the ideas that I'll be taking with me as part of our project. There was the aspect uh, of problems with resources. There are countries that have received interference from neighboring countries despite their accomplishments. Instead of spending money on sustainable development, uh, money was spent on weapons. Countries have to participate. There can't be peace without development or development without peace. We have to defend the rights of women. International interference leads to a breakdown in peace. When we talk about peace, we're talking about stability. We need to channel the role of citizens, and that is the role of parliamentarians. Res resources have to be used so that all citizens can have access to justice. I was delighted with the example of the Swiss Parliament, a four-year plan with oversight to see what the government is doing and what parliamentarians are doing and how oversight is achieved. Parliaments as a weapon for conflict prevention. I also wish to express my thanks to our experts. I should like to thank all of you for having agreed to the draft resolution. 
I am anxiously awaiting your statements before we go back to Geneva so that we can continue to feed into this important proposal. Thank you very much for your kind attention and for your interest. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Marisol Barcena. Well, uh, dear colleagues, um, we are almost finished our, our, our second sitting. Item six is the last item on our agenda and deals with any other uh, business. So uh, I once again thank you, uh, thank, thank you our experts, and I also thank the co-reporters for the extraordinary work they are doing, and all of you. So just just uh, before finish, let me uh, let me say that as you know. The rules of the IPU standing committees provide that the committees shall establish their own work plans and set their agendas. This means that the, consider that the consideration of draft resolutions on a topic is not their only responsibility. At its last meeting in DACA, the Bureau decided to propose that all the meetings of the committee at the 138th Assembly would focus on the resolution and that a side event on the ATT should be organized. It also decided to begin implementing the project on parliamentary strategies for comprehensive disarmament. So um, I see no objections to this course of actions. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, well, thank you again for all uh, your valuable participation and contributions during our two sittings. And I'm looking forward to see you once again in St. Petersburg, no, in Geneva, March next year. Well, thank you.